my suspicion is, first of all, that the precious metals continue higher. They may back and fill on the way, but continue higher. And my suspicion is that your um, information focus, your career focus on silver, will stand you in very good stead for the next 18 to 24 months. Hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics and really excited today to talk with one of my favorite investors, who is Rick Rule, who well, I've been following, geez, I guess back since 2010, 2011, when I was still a smart ass option trader, just getting into metals and seeing some of the incredible things going on. Obviously, Rick, one of the world's experts in looking at the mining and resource stocks. So, Rick, Pleasure to have you on here today. It was great to see you up in Vancouver. And how is everything going with you, my friend? Oh, my pleasure. Life is good. And it was delightful to see you in Vancouver. I look forward to seeing you again next year at the conference. Yeah, well, if silver keeps, keeps going up, I don't know how they're going to hold me back. I'm getting a little excited finally after the last eight years of watching uh, a tougher time for many metals investors. So... Perhaps to dig in, uh, fascinating things going on, especially with the lower prices. We've seen mines get shut down, supply falling. Um, so I'm curious, anything you could touch on from the supply and demand perspective to put, in, to put it into perspective for folks, what, what's going on with silver? Well, what's fascinating about silver and what's frustrating about silver is that the supply and demand picture is so complex. On the supply side, it's important to remember that less than 20% of worldwide primary silver production comes from silver mines. The rest comes from gold mines, copper mines, lead mines, zinc mines. And so to accurately forecast the future of new mine production from silver, you have to know uh, more than anyone could possibly know about copper markets, zinc markets, lead markets, and gold markets. Right. The other thing about silver that frustrates people's understanding of both supply and demand is the incredible holdings and cultural predilection for silver among people in South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and Sri Lanka. And so to understand something about silver investment demand, you have to be able to forecast farm gate prices in India, which is very tough to do. When Indian poor people make money in the harvest, they frequently store their money in silver. Uh, conversely, when, tar when hard times come in India, they're forced to cash in their savings, which increases silver supply. So the one thing I can tell you confidently about supply and demand in silver is that in 40 years of trying to understand it, I don't. Right. What I do understand uh, is that uh, Western investment demand, when it kicks in, dwarfs all the other factors. Yes. In four prior booms that I've lived through, what I've noticed is that gold moves first, and then silver stocks, and then that rare spec, uh, pardon me, silver itself, uh, the commodity moves, and then the silver stocks move. And high quality silver stocks are an extremely rare asset class. There are not very many silver stocks Right. and fewer high-quality silver stocks. So my suspicion, uh, having seen the gold trade pick up a bit, and just very recently having seen the silver trade pick up, uh, my suspicion is, first of all, that the precious metals continue higher. They may back and fill on the way, but continue higher. And my suspicion is that your um, information focus, your career focus on silver, will stand you in very good stead for the next 18 to 24 months. Well, I'm hoping so. Hopefully a little easier than the last, uh, last couple of years. Um, because silver really, when you look at the price and think about, again, you mentioned some of the complex factors with supply and demand. Although just thinking about it, we had $50 in 1980, then went back down to $5 for a while, then back up to 50, then all the way down to 14 again. Um, so it's really, I don't know if there's any other asset that, you know, has had that kind of volatility, which is somewhat unexplained. And is that really just a reflection of how there is, it is dominated at times by the speculative interest? 
I think the speculative interest does have a lot to do with the volatility in silver. Uh, but I think there's two other factors that you need to uh, pay attention to. One is the low unit cost. There are people who believe in the gold thesis, but either can't or don't believe they can afford it. And the consequence of that is that they play the gold game through silver. Right. That applies, again, particularly to poor people in South Asia that probably can't afford to participate in the metals markets on the gold side, so they, they participate in the silver side. The other thing that's interesting about silver for me relative to gold is that gold operates primarily, at least early in a bull market, on fear. People buy gold as a consequence of fear. They buy it as insurance. Later on, momentum buyers uh, enter into the gold trade. But silver feeds off both fear and greed. Right. Uh, and those are the two primary motor, you know, motivations in investments. And silver is, is unusual in the sense that it, uh, it, it feeds on both primary motivations and as a consequence is much more volatile. You probably remember from Vancouver, my, my displaying in my speech, a 40-year chart of the Barron's Gold Mining Index trying to point out two things, the extraordinary volatility in gold mining stocks right. and the fact that we are much, much, much closer to the bottom than the top. What's interesting about all that is that uh, silver stocks are even more volatile than gold stocks and arguably were even more washed out. If you think about the fact that silver stocks traditionally have more upside than gold side than gold stocks do, and if you think about the fact that the poorest of the last seven recoveries in gold stocks was a 150% increase in the beta, uh, and think about the fact that silver, at least the high quality silvers, probably have more upside historically than the gold stocks do, it gives you some uh, feeling for the potential order of magnitude move that we have in front of us. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, Rick, because one of the, the research I've done, I've gotten the feeling that, you know, my opinion is that gold and silver are lower than what might be a fair value, whatever that arbitrary number may be. Although it seems like, and maybe this has changed at some of the low current pricing, but still even relative to where gold and silver are trading, that a lot of, even if this is where the metal prices stayed for a while, again, maybe a little less so in silver for some of the primary miners, but that a lot of the equity prices are low, even relative to the current bullion prices. Would that be capturing it right? Uh, I think the equity prices probably reflect the net present value of free cash flows uh, at today's silver prices. I don't believe that today's silver prices are going to last. Right. Uh, I don't believe that because I think that investor perception by, for silver is driven by gold. And I think by proxy, the extraordinarily low uh, levels of interest payable on bonds, which is sort of the gold surrogate, right. uh, mean that the gold price is probably going higher. We have to predicate the talk that you and I are having in the face of $16 trillion yep. nominally negative yielding debt worldwide, probably $30 trillion in functionally negative yielding debt worldwide. And we need to think about that in the Jim Grant context, where he described the sovereign debt as, quote, return free risk. Yes. <laughs> Think about the concept of return free risk. If the anti-gold trade is return free risk, it makes gold really relatively attractive even to people who don't traditionally like gold. Grant again a different quote, gold is at least a good honest zero. Mm -hmm. A good honest zero is better than return free risk. And so if you take the premise that gold should do very well in dollar terms. And if you follow on the premise that, at least for the last 40 years, that silver has moved after gold, but has moved further than gold, and you carry it one more step, looking back again 40 years, that the silver stocks are perceived at least as the leveraged way to play silver, and they're rare. 
this is an interesting speculative opportunity. Yeah, especially because the market is just so darn small. And I think of, uh, I remember seeing an estimate, 76 trillion of the combined world stock markets. And then you have silver sitting here. Especially interesting in the time period we're in now where it looks like uh, the central bankers are having a chest thumping contest to see who can print their currency the fastest. Uh, and I think perhaps, you know, that has a large degree of why we're starting to see a little movement in the metals now. And I'm wondering if we have rate cuts in QE, geez, it sure seems like a lot of pressure on these markets. Because I know a lot of people are wondering, is another fake start? But um, how do you see that factoring in? Let's say it is a fake start. For how long? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all, because markets don't always go straight up, to see this market back and fill. Uh, if the listeners to this uh, interview would like, if they uh, email the email address I'll give you later, I will send them that 40-year chart of the Barron's Gold Mining Stock Index. Let's say just for fun that we're a year early. If you look at the magnitude of gains that are possible, the fact that you're a year early, while it might be frustrating, is absolutely irrelevant. It absolutely does not matter. But yep. then let's go back again into the probable causes of this with regards to timing. You mentioned quantitative easing. Many of your listeners would probably know it better if you used the term counterfeiting. <laughs> if the central banks do it, it's quantitative easing. But if it was such a good thing for the economy, why wouldn't President Bush allow you to issue uh, Chris Marcus notes? Oh. Uh, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that they conjure up a medium of exchange out of thin air and use it to buy in their own obligations tells you what they and what you ought to think it's worth. And that's probably the best argument of all for precious metals. There's a different argument for silver, which I'm beating this to death, but that argument is that it's also a speculative vehicle and has tended to outperform gold in the middle and late parts of the cycle. But I think if you go back to first principles, gold competes with bonds, and bonds are doing their very best to lose the war. <laughs> I, I was stunned to see we even have junk bonds negative yielding now, and it's, it's just... <laughs> That's a new category, return-free high risk. Yeah, and it even reminds me of my old uh, trading days when we were uh, training in mock trading, and if we did something that wasn't too ideal, we'd get yelled at for locking in a risk-free loss, so... Obviously, we have stock market at all-time highs, bond market, you know, rising by the day. And to the degree that people are looking to buy low and sell high, here you have metals that, even with the recent rally, um, sure look kind of cheap to me. One thing I found interesting is that it appears as if silver looks relatively cheap to someone else. There's been speculation based on the COT reports if there's a big whale out there somewhere, which we'll leave aside for now, but just the silver ETF data showing over 100 million ounces added to the ETFs in the past three months, which is a staggering amount in a market that, at least according to the Silver Institute, has been running a deficit over the past couple of years. Um, any thoughts on just the size of that and in what seems like a tight market, how much room is there before we see something not add up? Well, I'm not in a position to be able to discuss really the imbalance between above ground supply and the theoretical liabilities on the paper side of the silver trade. There are a lot of people who have discussed that at length, and that market is too opaque for me to talk about. Right. Not because I'm unwilling, just because I don't value my own opinion. But what I can tell you is it's sprot that we're getting millions of dollars of inbounds a day in our own physical silver trusts. Uh, and the data that you talk about with regards to the ETFs is wholly accurate. There is a lot of demand on the silver side. The, uh, it would be amusing 
for me. I don't know that it will occur. It would be amusing for me if some of the people on the paper side uh, called for delivery. Now, the physical exchanges do have the ability to put a force majeure clause in place and do cash mm -hmm. settlement. So the old type of short squeeze that people used to think about occurring isn't something that's going to occur. But really, maybe all of this is a sideshow. What we do know about the silver business and the gold business for that matter is that right now, and for the probable future, there are more buyers than sellers. <laughs> in yeah. my experience, when I've been in a market where there were more buyers than sellers, for reasons that everyone understood and everyone understands the reason here, the price goes up. I think one of the other things we forget in the silver trade is that silver has utility. Yep. And it's important to think about that utility. It's used in a wide variety of commercial applications. There are still, as an example, high-end imagery and photographic implications for silver, although that business is smaller. But it's an essential component in uh, solar panels. It's an essential component in uh, various biomedical technologies and water treatment technologies. And what's important to note in terms of the utility of silver is that a relatively small amount of silver contributes a lot of value. And the silver itself, the cost of the silver, is a small component in the cost of producing the finished product. As right. an example, a solar panel that's sold, uh, the cost of the silver in that silver panel is probably 3% of the finished cost of the panel. If the silver price tripled, it wouldn't affect demand for silver for silver panels because right. there's an awful lot of utility associated with it. Similarly, in things like eyewash and biomedical applications, the cost of the silver relative to the price of the finished product is irrelevant. That means that probably the price has to go up and the price can go up. That's very, very important. Similarly, something else that people don't look at, most of the silver that's produced is produced as a byproduct of base metals. If we are going into a recession, and this is not a forecast, I'm not saying we are going into a, into a recession, if we go into a recession and demand for copper and lead and zinc and tin fall, Production of byproduct silver will fall. That's the way these things work. I'm not saying that's going to occur, but if we see a circumstance where in a recession, the high utility of silver rather to its relative to its cost protects demand, because that's what happens in high margin applications, at the same time that supply falls as a consequence of other materials with lower economic utility, uh, that says wonderful things for the silver market, too. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, and I think people are picking up on that now where I like that you mentioned how it's a small amount of silver. So even if we get to 30 or, free or triple to $45 silver, we're not talking about substantially changing the price. Um, <clears throat> And especially that's one of the things that led me to silver more than gold early on where most of the gold is still out there and you know i can handle both sides of the debate of whether gold is money whether it's going to be used as money in the end i'm not really counting on people paying i mean maybe we'll be bartering in silver but if so much of it it's consumed you know <laughs> we're gonna need it somewhere which is a factor that I've always liked about silver, uh, um, even more so than gold. Um, and should we experience an environment like that? Let's say even we see the rally continue, we won't even go extreme, say $50 silver, but let's say we get up to $25 or $30 silver from here. For folks like myself who are looking for mining companies or royalties or prospect generators, is there a particular type that if you're looking solely for leverage on the move that people might want to be focusing on? Because the moves in silver stocks are so extraordinary, because the market beta is so high, what I would suggest is that most speculators focus on the higher quality companies. 
many silver speculators are dreamers and they buy companies that are so marginal that their only real connection to silver is that silver is part of the component of the name of the company. And if you think about it, if the price of something, silver, goes up and your company doesn't have any, it doesn't have a real impact on your value, although it may have an impact on perception. Right. So I would suggest, particularly as a 66-year-old, uh, when I have so much upside, if you take away some of my downside, I'll give back some of my upside. So I would begin a silver portfolio with the higher quality silver names, the more efficient silver producers. For those who understand and can afford the risks, by all means, take sort of 25% of that portfolio and buy some marginal silver producers with leverage. It's important though, if you think that the silver price is going to go up, that you buy a company that will benefit from the silver price going up over the period of time that the silver price is going to go up. Buying a company that'll be in production 12 years from now doesn't necessarily give you any definable advantage for a bull market that's gonna last three or four or five years. By contrast, finding a company that's a reasonably large silver producer now, has a reasonably good balance sheet, has reasonably low cost of production, uh, and has the ability to grow in the time frame that you anticipate that that market will exist over, can yield you fantastic benefits. The takeaway from this is that the beta, the upside that the market, the high quality market offers you, is so extraordinary that you don't need to take outsized risks in order to generate outsized rewards. Right. And I, I guess I'll, I'll leave aside for now that I'm doing an options trading on Silver Miners webinar later today since you, you mentioned having some adult supervision in these matters. Well, for people who acknowledge the risks that they're taking and are willing to do it, listen, uh, whenever I joke about speculation and I talk about my investing, my wife reminds me that all of the money that I now invest prudently, I made by speculating wildly. As long as people understand what they're doing, that's great. Uh, and if you have an audience that are experienced options traders and understand it, that understand the risks and can afford both psychologically and financially the risks, uh, speculation is a wonderful thing. You just need to put it in context. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, certainly, it's not something I would recommend for most folks, although, like you said, anything, if you understand the risks and the payouts are justified and your position to take those on can be a good thing to do sometimes. And um, last question for you, Rick. Uh, I know you can't dig into stocks specifically publicly, but perhaps if uh, there are any miners that, you know, uh, you mentioned that if you're an owner of that you can comment on and uh, maybe that folks might be well served to consider and do their own dil due diligence on. Yeah, I can't make recommendations to your viewers because they're not clients, first of all. And second of all, I don't know them. And so <laughs> I don't know what's suitable for them. I can tell you a few stocks that I own personally and why I own them. Uh, I own wheat and precious metals, uh, which although it's now economically a gold dominant company, has substantial revenues and importantly 70% operating margins in the silver business. In addition, they have streams and royalties over large deposits that, while they're currently uneconomic at today's silver prices, come into the reserves category at higher silver prices. So there's more leverage in wheat and precious than most people recognize as, as, as a consequence of their large resource holdings. Uh, I, I think uh, Pan American silver is core to my own silver portfolio. I was involved actually in the first financing of the company many years ago, so I know it well. And it has an owner, Ross Beatty, who is the chairman of the company, the founder. There's adult supervision in place to look after the shareholders there. There is, I believe, enormous upside, um, both in Guatemala and Argentina. Very large deposits there aren't in production. Now, given where they are and given the social challenges in both places, you need to be willing to uh, assume of course, some political risk. On the exploration side, which is substantially dicier, uh, I own some mag silver. That's an emerging 
a tier one producer. And I own some Silvercrest, which I think is a, a, a tier two deposit that may become a tier one deposit for the riskier parts of my portfolio. There are other names I could get into, but I would need to know uh, your listeners better before I got into the dicier names. I should say that I also own um, some companies that have less technical risk, but more political risk. I'm thinking in these names, uh, Industria Españoles, uh, the big Mexican silver producer, which has a political risk in the form of the current president of Mexico, who I think it's fair to say is anti-mining, uh, and Minera Buenaventura, uh, the large Peruvian producer, as well as Polymetal, the Russian producer. This is not for the faint of heart or for people who pay too much attention to the political risks as evidenced in the nightly news. I own them, uh, but I have a fairly thick constitution with regards to political risk. Yeah, although again, another one of those factors where if you do your homework and understand the political risk and how it's being priced, um, certainly good opportunities that could be found. So I appreciate you sharing that. And for the folks that would like to contact you and get some more specific advice, uh, perhaps in wrapping up, you can just let them know how to find you. Well, I'd like to make my final offer, which I've made to your subscribers once before. If your listeners and subscribers would like me to rank their natural resource portfolios, including, of course, their silver portfolios, but all of their natural resource portfolios. If they would send me an email to rankings, R-A-N-K-I-N-G-S, at SprottGlobal.com, including their resource portfolios, both names and symbols in text, acknowledge the fact that I'm a 66-year-old inadvertent Luddite and make it easy for me, I will rank their holdings and send them back. Uh, in addition, if they'd like that 40-year uh, Barron's Gold Mining Index, uh, I'll send that too. Just mentioned that you'd like the uh, gold share chart, and I'll send that too. It's, it's really, really instructive. It probably could have saved me most of the interview that we just did. Uh, looking at the extraordinary upside in these stocks and where we are now relative to their historical highs and lows. Well, it sure is going to be a fascinating ride to see how this all unfolds. Uh, I tend to see things getting out of control sooner than later, given the way the world is shaping up right now. Although in either case, really appreciate you joining me. Appreciate you've been a really good friend to me over the years and a good mentor, which has meant a lot. So it's really nice to see how your success has come along and great to catch up with you today. And we'll enjoy talking silver over the next coming years. Well, thank you for your kind year, uh, kind words. Uh, use me up while you have me. Uh, I enjoy the process. All right, sir. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.